a, basically a recap of, of what we have looked at over the last weeks. Uh, I am not in, I, I'm going to go on at record right now with my hand in the air. I do not like a series to go more than 13 weeks uh, for lots of reasons. One, it's easy for people to lose interest. And two, uh, I think that sometimes writers have written books just to write books so that they can get their name in print. Uh, I know C. Leonard Allen. I have read several of his books over the years. He's, he's a very scholarly person. Uh, I, I think that if I had written this book, I would have gone a little different direction than what he went. Uh, I, th I think he just kind of went and grabbed some things out of history and, and put them all together and, and made the book. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be any coherence uh, from the front to the back of it. It just seems to be uh, you could take any one week and make a lesson out of it and not even have to have the rest of them if you didn't want to. I've got quite a bit I want to cover tonight simply because we're winding this up. Ralph Ellison said in 1964, that which we remember is more often than not that which we would like to have been or have happened or that which we hope to be. And so our memory and our identity are always at odds and our history always a tale that is told by inattentive idealists. Uh, I tried to find out in the last month if the history of Oak Ridge is taught in our public schools. And to my knowledge at this time, I think the answer is no. And you'd sort of think that since we're here in the seat of all that took place during World War II, that there would certainly be something that would be given. I know from experience of working with the American Museum of Science and Energy that we're fixing to move to a new, a new facility that's 30 years older than the one we're in now. I, that's the only way I know how to express it. People ask me when I'm there on Mondays, when are you going to move? And I said, we were told last October. Then it was last November. Then it was last February. Then it was March. And, and right now, we still don't know. But we have been told that we're going to be closing down sometime in the latter part of July. And there is a high possibility and even a probability that we will not even be open for about three months. And then the record is not going to be the same as what we have tried to tell over the last few years. The basic premises of that particular foundation was to tell the story of what happened here during World War II. And we're not so sure that that story is going to continue to be told in the new museum. So this kind of represents the changes in history that take place. The countries that you learned on a globe and on a map when you went to school, a great number of those don't exist anymore. Or they have a different name than what they were when you and I learned them. And if you talked about some place in, in the world and somebody looked at you like you were had escaped from the loony bin, they might think, well, uh, you're not up to date. History oftentimes comes out in the eye of the beholder. It comes out the way that people want to see it sometimes. That's what Ralph Ellison was trying to say. And sometimes the real story, the true story, the basic story gets lost. And we have all of this flowery stuff. And if you don't believe that's true, you wait until some man is the President of the United States, regardless of what he does or what he doesn't do, and listen to his story after he's out of office. You see, that's the way that history is oftentimes told. Not the way that it is, but the way that we sometimes want it to be or hope that it will be 
or that it will be changed into in some time in the future. That's true about the history of the church. The quote, those who forget history are condemned to repeat it, is attributed to the American philosopher George Santayana. And it can be accurately quoted as, quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, as stated in his work, The Life of Reason, Reason, and Common Sense. I have interviewed uh, people from Germany uh, and people from Japan, uh, television crews, writers, newspaper people that have come to, to see our museum. And I've always tried to be a very kind and, and, and gentle docent to try to teach them our position of what happened. I have never yet said that the reason Oak Ridge existed is because you guys started the war. But that's a fact. That's one of those facts that sometimes you have to kind of keep it under the counter. And one of the questions I was asked by a, a German uh, uh, I think they were, they were filming, so it must have been a, a, a news crew, a television news crew. He asked me, he said, why is Oak Ridge here? And I said, it was put here in order to help end the war. And he wasn't too happy with that, and he tried to pursue it a little bit further. And finally he got to the point, I said, well, in the, when he asked the question, he said, well, did the people here know what they were doing? And I said, to the most part, no, not until the war was, was finished or almost over, not until the first bomb was dropped. Well, how did you keep that so, so, so secret? I said, we didn't talk to each other. <laughs> it was that simple. And so evidently they didn't have that kind of, of, of problem uh, in, in other places. So sometimes what people are told on one side is not the same as what people on the other side hear or are told themselves. If we cannot remember the past, we're condemned to repeat it. I always say to them, the proudest thing that we are about Oak Ridge is the fact that our bomb has not been used in warfare again in over 70 years. And I let that sink in. Because part of our story is to tell the story of what happened so it does not happen again. Now, when our generation is gone, the story may also be gone. So we have to be very careful that we preserve history. This lesson is the last of this series called Distant Voices. And over the past weeks, we have looked at a number of people, situations, doctrines, and challenges, all that have happened among those who have claimed to be the result of what is called the Restoration Movement. It's kind of interesting because a number of the religious groups that are around us today are sort of sidling into a Restoration Movement of going back to the Bible. Of course, that was the foundation of what the Restoration Movement was about. Today's modern church has certainly come a long way from that church that was established on Pentecost that's recorded in the book of Acts. We, do no, we no longer wear bed sheets to church. We do not have torches to light the building at night. We do not meet all day long like they probably did. And so there is a great difference in that. They had the apostles and we don't. Some of the progress from the first century could be classed as good, very good. Some of it is bad and some of it perhaps questionable of what things, have, uh, what things have been done and what people have said and what has happened as far as the church is concerned. As a study comes to a close, we may all breathe a sigh of relief that some of the things studied seem to have been settled or at least no longer occupy our daily thoughts and practices. Uh, when was the last time that you heard a lesson on the millennial or the millennium? I can't remember even preaching over 40 years that I 
preached more than three or four lessons about the second coming of Christ. Men and women that have contributed to the history of the why and the how that we got to where we are today are interesting. And sometimes it's a little bit scary. Sometimes what we remember about the past is distorted by what we want it to say to us. I think if you took the average member of the church that's between the ages of 20 and 30, maybe even 35, and ask them, do you think the church today is like it was 100 years ago? 200 years ago, 2,000 years ago. I suspect that most of them would say, well, yeah. And it would be kind of a questionable answer because they're not familiar with the history. And you are familiar with some of it. We want to verify where we are now and what we believe now and not interfere with where we want to go. We often forget that most of these great individuals of our faith were merely sheep wandering in the wilderness, not knowing where they were going nor where they would wind up eventually. Trial and error, difficulties, coming to stone walls and saying, I don't think I can believe that anymore, but they had believed it for years. And a number of them changed their positions and beliefs over the years in their study and the progression of what they thought was right. Alexander Campbell was one of those. Barton Stone was one of those. Others that were found, what we call the foundation of that, which is called the Restoration Movement, all moved from where they were to a different place over a period of time. We have studied the beginning of the Restoration Movement in America. And this movement was in rebellion against the dictates of the Roman Catholic Church, the religious movements that became the Protestant movement, and the general decadence of religion in general. You have to remember that the Crusades were part of religion. Uh, you may not have learned an awful lot about the Crusades in school, but they were as a religious holy war to throw the Muslims out of the Holy Land. That's all that they were. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica sitting in the, the middle of Rome today was built because of what were called indulgences. And an indulgence that was sold by Roman Catholic priests was the right to commit a sin. And the worse the sin, the more you paid and that's how that building was particularly built. That's history. The invention of the movable type printing press aided in the spread of the Bible being into the hands of the common people. And when the people began to learn to read, and they read what they wanted to read was the Bible. A number of years ago when I was in uh, Newport, Tennessee, I got involved in uh, adult uh, reading program. And we were assigned individuals that, that uh, adults that, that could not read. And you think that that's, that doesn't exist in our society today. Yes, it does. And 95% of the people that were in that program, the reason they wanted to learn to read was to learn to read the Bible. And the fellow that I taught his ABCs and how to read, when he graduated at the end of the program, I presented him with a Bible. And the tears rolled down his cheek. He says, I can read this now. And I hope he has and continue to. People have read for themselves what God provided and, and found many things contrary to the scriptures being taught and practiced by, the, by their current religions. That's what motivated the come about of what was called the Protestant movement, and then from that, the Restoration Movement here in America. We have studied early leaders of the Restoration Movement, such as James O. Kelly, who was a Methodist, Dr. Abner Jones, who was a Baptist, Barton W. Stone, who was a Presbyterian, who wrote the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery, we have 
looked and talked about Thomas Campbell, who was a Presbyterian. He's the one that coined the phrase, where the scriptures speak, we speak, and where the scriptures are silent, we're silent. In 1809, he wrote the Declaration and Address. His son was Alexander Campbell. He was also Presbyterian. He was a student of the Haldane Brothers in Scotland. He came to America in 1809 at the age of 21. And on his own, while he was still in Scotland, had arrived at almost exactly the same position as his father, yet totally independent of each other across the ocean. And he became the most outstanding spokesman of the Restoration Movement, and he was a friend of Henry Clay. Dr. Robert Richardson, who was the autobiographer of, uh, the biographer of, of Alexander Campbell, was also a medical doctor. He was the family physician for Alexander Campbell. He spent much of his life teaching and working as administrator of Bethany College. And he was associate editor for Campbell's Millennial Harbinger magazine for nearly 30 years, which is very interesting. Richardson was the one that we talked about that felt like that the primary focus uh, of the assembly itself on Sundays was the Lord's Supper. Uh, he's the one that wrote the book uh, about uh, the Lord's Supper. And I read uh, one of his uh, uh, communion table uh, uh, talks uh, that he gave. And this is what he was really known for. I want you to remember from this series that these men were moving away from the total experiential type of religion as the great revival in 1804 at Cane Ridge. Uh, some of this type of religion is still in existence today with some of the religious groups that are around about us. Uh, the experiential type of religion means that you have to have some kind of experience that gets you through or over being a sinful individual into, into the kingdom of God. That's where the, the mourner's bench has come from and what it still exists today in some religious groups. These people were seeking to find out what would become and be called the New Testament, Christ, New Testament Christianity based upon what examples are found in the New Testament. Campbell even went so far as to uh, write his own version or at least translate his own version of the New Testament. Often these people stumbled around and upon what they were looking for, and yet at times they missed it completely. They were attempting to move past the Reformation into what was later called the Restoration Movement. Away from Roman Catholicism, and then away from Protestant uh, religion. And in so doing, they were forging a new and different system of contact with God, with Christ, the Bible, and those that call themselves Christians only. David Lipscomb, we spent about three weeks dealing with Lipscomb. I wasn't too sure that we needed to spend that much time on him. Probably found out some interesting things about him. The history about Lipscomb is very different from what most of us think of it today. We think of him as a kindly old gentleman that sat on the porch reading his Bible and founding uh, the Nashville Bible School, which is now known as Lipscomb University. And this was the kindliest old gentleman, and this was a tough old bird. I'll guarantee you that from other histories that I have read. He was born in Huntland, Tennessee, which is also the same area that Phil Fulmer has come from. And Johnny Majors also came from that general area down there. And I preached in that general area down there for about six years. Now that doesn't make me a great scholar either. Lipscomb opposed Christian involvement in political affairs. He said, first of all, that Christians should not run for office. And secondly, even more than that, that they should not even vote. That the being a Christian was living in a different world than that of which was around us. And I have never been able to see how you could separate the two. Even Paul, when he was threatened with death, said, I appeal to Caesar. What did that mean? He recognized what the law said. 
And he knew that it was only going to be the thing that would save his life. And so he was sent to Caesar. He also founded and edited the Gospel Advocate from 1866 to 1912 when he died. Lipscomb's thoughts again, they should stand aloof from civil government, should refuse to hold political offices, they should not participate in war, and they should not vote. Uh, since he lived during the time of, of uh, around the end of this, in this, during the Civil War, I'm sure that that was a very hot topic. But you have to realize that the church in the South and the church in the North uh, had already split over this idea of uh, serving in warfare. And there were other, other things that, that the church had split over. And the church in the South was much more conservative than the church in the North. Lipscomb concluded that the poor of this world were chosen vessels of mercy, the especially honored and blessed of God, and they as a class constitute his elect. He often repeated that the great mass of this true and honored fellows of all, followers of all ages of the world have been, ever must be, from the poor. Here's what Lipscomb thought about preachers, and he was one of them also. He was concerned about the effects of wealth on the work and the aspirations of preachers. Their central work should be among the poor and the common people, but large salaries turn their heads into another direction. Alexander Campbell's position on preachers was that preachers uh, ought to have a vocation that supported them. Uh, it was easy for him to say he was a rich guy. Uh, and he never served congregations that had 12 or 13 members. Uh, that's, I'm glad some of that's changed. To pay large salaries, he said, is to excite the thirst for wealth and corrupt the simplicity of the life of the preacher. This unfits him for, success, un, for successful work among the common people. Uh, I'm I'm glad that this is not a ruling thought in, in the church today. I really am. I think you get what you pay for. And I remember the first place that I preached full time in Barnesville, Georgia. We'd been there two weeks and a, we had a free gospel meeting given to us. And this old adage, you get what you paid for, was really true. The guy that came in and held our meeting wasn't happy where he was staying. He wasn't happy with what he had to eat. He wasn't happy on who we called on to, to offer prayer at the church services. He wasn't happy because everybody in the community didn't come to hear him, uh, which would have been interesting because nobody down there had ever heard of him. I had never heard of him uh, myself. And the only thing that we could actually say in honesty to him when he left is we hope you had a safe trip home. And I suspect that he did because we never heard from him again. Lipscomb said, controlling the church by virtue of authority of office is unknown in the scriptures. His position on elders and deacons having an office in the church was one of those things that he harped on quite considerably. He said it was unknown in the scriptures and all should seek to control simply and only through the authority of truth impressed by lives of godliness, purity, and love. Uh, I don't know how that got in there twice. Not only did he become a crusty foe of the, of the missionary societies promoted in the Restoration Movement, he also opposed the concept of an official eldership. So there were a great number of things that a lot of these preachers were again rather than for. And I think maybe today that the challenge that our preachers have is, is maybe there ought to be a few more things that we ought to be against instead of being for so much stuff that we are for. But I think that Christianity is a very positive position to take. Lipscomb did not accept that elders in a congregation were officers because an officer was one who was appointed to do a work which he could not do without appointment. 
I have always taken the position myself as a preacher that the best men for the eldership are those that are doing an elder's work even if they're not appointed. There's nothing that I know of that elders do that others cannot do. Except be an elder. And I think being an elder usually describes uh, the concept that these are to be older individuals. We had a special lesson on elders, church government, and where we are today. Uh, I gave you my particular views uh, about elders and, and that. And re even regardless of how and what you think about it, some disagree as to whether or not elders are in office in the church or that they have any authority to make decisions for the congregation. We started out this lesson is, what if there were no elders in the church? What would you have? And you'd have chaos. Uh, if you've ever reverted to that time, men, in which there was a men's meeting and there was no eldership, you understand the chaos that the church can find itself involved with. Uh, a, number, a great number of the years that I preached uh, in many, most of the congregations, uh, there, were, there was not an eldership. And I got to the point where I s said, I will not uh, seek out to serve a congregation that does not have an eldership. And sometimes an eldership is worse than no eldership. I know that from experience also. The Bible says he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors or bishops or elders or teacher and teachers. And the reason that he did this is because of for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Until we all come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect individual, perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Until we get to be like Jesus. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. We talked about the problem with stained glass, of how that there was controversy in the church over a number of years over uh, the size of buildings, the ornateness of buildings. Uh, and oftentimes those that complain the most about the big ones are the ones that lived in the little ones. Uh, it's sort of like that little poem the fellow says, I complained about my shoes until I met somebody that had no, had no feet. And then I quit complaining about my shoes. Whether a church has stained glass windows or not is up to them. It's their business. It's nobody else's business. If you don't have any, that's, the, that's your business. If you don't want any, that's your business. But it's not your business to tell somebody else what is right or wrong of what they're doing. Your responsibility is where you are. You heard the old saying, bloom where you're planted. You can't bloom somewhere else. And you're not responsible for somebody else. You're responsible for yourself getting there. And so whether it's a beautiful scene like this of Jesus being crucified on the cross or other things. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was one of these people that, uh, and this is not the Benjamin Franklin that flew the kite. This is the one who was a preacher in Cincinnati. He and others in the movement found this lavish building deeply offensive. They viewed it as a symbol of a disturbing trend, the move toward big city respectability and the desire to accommodate the growing urban affluence. Why do we have padded seats? That's so you won't slide across it and get a splinter. You'll just get rug burn if you slide too much on it. I, it makes no difference. It makes no difference of what color carpet. It makes no difference whether the, the pews are padded or they're not padded. It doesn't make any difference whether your songbooks are blue or red or green. Uh, you know, and people have gotten upset over a lot of these things over the years. And part of this study is to see the, how that, that this has caused the church 
to be less than what it should be. One minister observed in 1874, the country is now but a suburb of the city and its simple matters, manners moderate desires and autonomous life as good as being disappeared. Uh, any of you ever remember having dinner on the ground? First place I went to, they say they're going to have dinner on the ground. And they lied to me. It was on the back of a hay, hay truck, hay trailer. I thought they were going to spread it out on the ground. They put it on a hay trailer. But they called it dinner on the ground. I guess years before they had hay trailers, that they probably spread it on the ground. And they just still continue to call it that. So we have to realize that oftentimes as as our nation has urbanized, it has become more citified, that things have changed considerably. Uh, when I was at Lipscomb, I was about 10 years older than all of the others in my class because I had been out, gone to work, worked for the J.C. Penney Company for a while, and then went back to school uh, to get my piece of paper that says that I'm a preacher. And there were a lot of the kids that were there that had come from out in the country, down in Possum Holler, down out of Podunk County. And some of the things that they were being taught, they were just bewildered by. And Brother Baxter called me into his office one day and he said, Brother Wallace, he said, you're older than some of these other students. You've been around. You've been doing a little preaching and you said you've, you know, you've got some experience behind you. He said, what's going on? And I told him, I said, the guys that you're talking about are not heretics. I said, the things that they're teaching, you can go down here and get a world book encyclopedia and read the very same thing. I said, the problem is the kids in the classes that have never been exposed to this kind of world history about the church and about religion in general. And that's just about that much over their head is all. And I was thanked and they kept the guys on uh, the payroll, which I was glad because they were both nice guys. We talked about tradition and different problems about tradition. There's Tevi from Fiddler on the Roof. I did not know how else to kind of illustrate the concept of, of tradition. During this particular period of time, religious traditions took a beating. People increasingly challenged traditional religious authorities. They challenged the Christian tradition in the eyes of many people and it became little more than a sordid tale of corruption and oppression, a story of priestcraft and its enslavement of people's minds. Now you remember, this is a group of people that are moving out of Roman Catholicism and also out of Protestantism. And the old time-worn traditions, after all, were maintained by clerics, by creeds, and by hierarchical church structures. A man by the name of Hinsdale in 1879, wrote a work, and he sounded many of the familiar notes. He upheld the Protestant ideal of, of Scripture alone against Roman Catholic claim to an infallible church tradition. He argued that Protestants have never really understood Protestantism, and they reject the authority of tradition in principle, but they hung on to many of the extra-biblical traditions in practice. Do you know where the tradition of wearing robes came from by a number of our religious groups that are around about us. Even the Roman Catholics uh, know that their clerics in wearing robes came from Judaism. After all, what is the Old Testament all about? Judaism. And the priestly robes go down back in the book of Exodus and the book of Deuteronomy and start reading in there about how ornate the garb was that the high priest and the priest had to wear. It would have been worse than most women trying to get ready to go somewhere today 
to get him ready to do the services uh, in, in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. We talked about women in the church and Selena Moore Holman, an elder's wife from Fayetteville, Tennessee, which I preached there for about six years, challenged some of the traditional assumptions and provoked sharp and lively exchanges with David Lipscomb that continued off and on for many years. Some of the arguments that she made were, there were several passages indicating that women were prominent workers in the early church. There were. There were others seeming to teach differently from 1 Corinthians 14 and 34 when Paul said, let the women keep silent in the church. She cited Deborah, the judge of Israel. She cited Anna, the prophetess in Luke 2. She cited Priscilla, who taught Apollos. And notice that she didn't say Priscilla and Aquila, uh, who, who taught Apollos in Acts 18. Uh, again, and she cited Philip's four daughters who prophesied. But I think the way that it's written in the book, it said that preached alongside their father or something like that. And that doesn't say that. Uh, Mrs. Holman had the same problem as a number of other individuals, oftentimes taking a subject or a phrase and letting that be the whole of everything that they talked about. Uh, she rejected the distinction between private and public spheres that Lipscomb and others sought to maintain, saying that a woman could not teach in a public sense, but she could teach in a private sense. And Mrs. Holman said, well, if I teach 100 people in private, what's the difference between teaching 100 people in private and teaching 100 people in public? Uh, and it's kind of interesting that I've not seen any of the arguments that have ever really detailed very much of the fact that God basically has always chosen man or men to lead in the worship uh, throughout all of the history of, of the scriptures. Uh, there are very few occasions that are different and the situations uh, were different under where those per people were. Uh, that distinction, she argued, was much more cultural than it was scriptural. Uh, she used uh, the illustration in the book of Acts where Lydia and the women had gone down to the river and they were praying. Didn't seem to be any men down there. What else are they going to do? It's sort of like having a ladies' class. A ladies' class is for ladies. That's why men don't go in there. They might learn something. Uh, and the problem oftentimes is when you have a men's class, are women invited? Not usually. What's the purpose of having a men's class? Well, we could have a class like this and have men and women both in it. Well, see, we make distinctions ourselves that sometimes become doctrine years later. She's rejected Lipscomb's position that God had made women more emotional and less rational than man. Most men are not very rational to start with. She was also rejected Lipscomb's position that women were suited for nurturing children but not for public teaching and leadership. And I'm going to have to hurry to get through. Robert Milligan said the, diac the uh, diaconate of the primitive church was not confined to male members, he wrote in 1868. Deaconesses were also appointed to attend the wants of the sick and the needy, especially to their own sex. And since the poor and the needy will always remain, churches will always require the attention of both deacons and deaconesses just as much as they did in the churches of Jerusalem, Sincrea, and Ephesus. Now, and I'm going to say this again in a few more minutes at the close. What others did is not necessarily the pattern for what we do. What transpired under a certain circumstance, that circumstance may not exist today. And I will always concede that when there is a woman that has a particular problem and she's by herself, that it is probably and usually better for some woman in the congregation to help her and to deal with her. Now that's not always true. But it's generally true. And so whether or not that you label these women that do these special works as deaconesses is up to the local congregation on its own. 
We have no such custom here. So, I, that's, I don't know how to make it any simpler. Phoebe, he said, should therefore, therefore constitute a part of the diakonoi of every fully organized congregation. What they did is not to be enforced upon us. What we do is not to be enforced upon the church in the future. What we do is what we do. E.G. Sewell said, women are not official deaconesses any more than men were official deacons. They, they, see, the, these things went back and forth uh, through the church many, many different times. To him, both men and women occupied exactly the same role, appointed servants and nothing more, saying that there is nothing absolutely in the use of the Greek word diakonoi, or in a correct translation of it to justify such an official idea. Sewell was troubled to see a specific class of men in the church called deacons, for he believed that that term should be applied to anyone that serves in any capacity in the church. Why do we call them a custodian instead of a deacon? That's our custom. So you see how sometimes these things can be stretched to be, make something out of it that it's not really intended to be. Uh, J, J, uh, James Alexander Harding said, If one is righteous, he does not need to lay up for treasures for the future, such as the need arises, the supply will come. This is as certain as any other doctrine of God. For 36 years, he wrote in 1910, I have endeavored to follow the directions of Jesus. Literally, I have avoided the accumulation of property. I have no house, no land, no stock, no property, except that which we daily use, no money laid up for the future. Aren't you glad you weren't one of his children? Yeah, funny ideas, you know. Preachers are funny guys. He said he rarely possessed as much as $50 at one time, and when he did, he most often used it for immediate needs, like eating. E.G. Sewell, co-editor of the Gospel Avid, good friend of Lipscomb. Uh, they worked together for more than 50 years. Uh, we talked about him. An exchange between Harding and Sewell uh, was a constant theme. Uh, he called it the law of special providence, meaning that one who gives his all to Christ in his kingdom is as certain to be supplied with all that he needs as Christ reigns. And no biblical teaching gave the believer more joy, confidence, and freedom from worry. His idea was that simple, trusting faith in God's daily care was the greatest need of the church. I don't know about you, but I have to get up in the morning. You may not have to. And God bless you if you don't have to. But I know by looking at several of the faces that are here, we're going to be here tomorrow because we've got a job to do. Right, Johnny? That's amen. And we sure are glad that Don's back. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about T.B. Lairdemore and uh, his positions and most of the time he was a, a fence rider uh, his stand on four key issues dividing the restoration movement with that of uh, the instrumental music in worship, missionary societies co uh, attendance at cooperative meetings and salary contracts for preachers or located preachers uh, full-time versus part-time or visiting and traveling preachers. Uh, these were the key issues in his day and time. He says, these are all opinions. You have your opinion. I have my opinion. Let's talk about Christ and the church. Someone asked Larry Moore what wing of the church he belonged to, loyal, digressive. You see, label, labeling is not a new thing. It's something that has gone on for years and years. Campbell was known as in the, in the beginning as being part of the New Light Succeeder Church, Presbyterian Church. And that separated them from the non-succeeding Presbyterian Church. Larry Moore replied, I've never 
I propose never to stand identified with one special wing, branch, or party of the church. My aim is to preach the gospel, to do the work of an evangelist, to teach God's children how to live, and to live as nearly as possibly perfect a life as possible. Uh, he would not take a side on these issues. He accepted those on either side as his brothers in Christ, and that was what was important. We talked about K.C. Moser, uh, Kenneth, Kenny Carl Moser, and G.C. Brewer. Moser proposed what he called, opposed what he called the plan theory, hearing, faith, repentance, confession, baptism, what others call the five-finger gospel. Brewer also took up this same position. And Moser and Brewer fully agreed on a basic point. The whole story of human redemption is comprehended in two words, grace and faith. But they had a plan. And uh, Moser's problem with the plan was not the plan, but as with as many preachers, he saw and landed on a phrase in the scripture that was what he thought to be the basis of all his preaching. And his emphasis was on Christ crucified in grace and faith, which was his plan. Now we talked about going back to the meaning of the word gospel. Today most of us would agree that to define the gospel would be this, the good news about Christ and what He's done for us. Jesus died, He was buried, He arose again the third day. I'm going to uh, skip this one and get to the end right here, a recap of our study. We looked at some of the history of the Restoration Movement and how we've come to be where we are today. We have seen men and women of the past who have influenced the church in their particular ways, some good, some strange, and some not so good, as we would view it today. We have noticed there was not always agreement on what should be said, practiced, or preached over the years. Duh. Don't we have the same problem today? We do. We have seen some subjects that we can hold on to, others that we are glad that it's not practiced or preached today. In every era of the church, there have been divisions. That is the sad truth of the history of the church. What was good for back then may not be good for what is today. They probably would not agree very much to air conditioning. I love it, especially on a good hot day. You remember the times in which we didn't have air conditioning when the windows opened and, you, and the kids in the evening and everybody watched the wasp fly around and see who it was going to land on and hoped it stung somebody to interrupt what the preacher was saying? The bat, yeah, I've not been in that situation. My dad told a story about he was at a, at, a, at a gospel meeting one time and a mouse ran up the preacher's leg. And he grabbed the, his britches and he squuzzed. And my dad said he squuzzed that, that mouse until the water ran out of it. I think it was more than water that ran out of the, the, the mouse. A lot of different things. What they did and what we do can be two very different things. And regardless of what we hold on to, the church today is what we make it. It is not what others did. It's not what they practiced. It, that, is the standard, that is the standard for the church of this 21st century. And regardless of how much we respect or even reverence the people and their work and their practices of times past, we stand on our own relationship to God and Christ as the foundation of our faith today as they did in their day and time. What they did or they did not do is not the foundation of Bible teaching. What they did or did not do was the product of how they interpreted what they read in the Scriptures. And may God bless us in our endeavors to restore that church that we read about in the New Testament. And let the distant voices be just that, voices of the past. 
I want to thank you for your kind patience in my teaching of this class. And I have signed this. Now, some have asked, what are we going to do past this week? As far as I know, I have not been relieved of my position here to teach this class. Have I, Johnny? Oh, okay. I thought I better ask before I do this. Huh? Because he's the only elder that's in here. If you'd like to teach the class, you're welcome. Okay. Oh, okay. If you don't know Tommy real well, you ought to, you ought to learn to know him. He's a, he's a great guy. He doesn't know much, but he's a great guy. <laughs> That's right. It's like that girl said one time, she liked her men, tall, dark, and handsome. And I said, well, I'm here, and he's not. <laughs> that didn't work either. Beginning next Wednesday night, we are going to study character lessons from Bible characters. Uh, and Tommy, if you, I'll get a little bit of work out of you, please. And uh, somebody else over here. Get Dennis? Okay. You guys pass these out. This is what we're going to study for the next quarter. Bible lessons from Bible characters, and I've given you a list of the individuals. Some of them you're going to have to guess out. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a book that I put together uh, almost 10 years ago, and I have never taught it as a class. So we're both going to be babes in the wilderness on this. Uh, you'll have to guess at some of these. Uh, Next week, I've, in fact, uh, I will give you two lessons next week uh, that you can follow. One that we will be studying and then the, the following week so you can do a little research if you want to. So I will be up to that. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You did a great job. <laughs>